is the West Side King's Church podcast, where we aim to encounter and embody the surprising grace of Jesus. Well, welcome back, everyone. It's great. I'm here with uh, David Harvey and Phil Odd. And David, you uh, continued in our series um, just this past week. And so I guess as we've been starting these podcast times together, um, the famous question is, what did you leave out? Is there anything you want to say and build upon um, from yesterday's teaching? <laughs> what um, I... I read much less of Willie Jennings commentary than I was intending to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I am. Um, I sat down last night and, uh, and so, you know, we've, we've talked about Jennings acts commentary as, as one of these sort of texts, which, which challenges all of us. And I think, and I feel like there's, I don't feel like you should read a commentary so that you'll agree with everything the commentator says, right? Uh, and I feel like almost that's a great – for me, that's a great rule of reading, isn't it? Don't mm-hmm. just read – was it C.S. Lewis that used to talk about his strategy was to read an old book and then a new book, a book he knew he'd agree with, and then a book he knew he'd disagree with. Um, mm-hmm. And that was his strategy for being formed. Um, but in this early chapters, I, I find um, – you know, Jennings kind of quite challenging. And, and, and I opened it up last night to do some further reading and saw instantly opened it to a, a, a quote that I was like, oh man, I should have used that quote in my <laughs> sermon um, where he says, he says, Luke gives us sight of a holy wind blowing through structured and settled ways of living and possessing and pulling things apart. People caught up in the love of God not only began to give thanks for their daily bread, but daily offered to God whatever they had that might speak that gracious love to others. Uh, And he says, he then goes on to talk a little bit about how God's love doesn't always play the way we want it to. And, um, which I which I find you know really quite really quite challenging and and then he sort of lands with this he says in the moment we think so bear in mind we're thinking about this relating to Acts two forty two they had everything in common they shared what they have they're selling possessions Jenny says this in the moment we think something is ours or our people's that same God will demand that we sell it give it away or offer more. <laughs> or offer more of it in order to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, using it to create the bonds of share, shared life. And I love mm-hmm. that notion of the moment I think something's mine, but I open up myself to the Holy Spirit, there's a possibility that God will <laughs> ask me to give it away. And yeah. uh, and I feel like we probably could have made a whole sermon out of that as well, but I didn't. I didn't squeeze that into yesterday. <laughs> Isn't this going to be the common theme? Yeah. What What would you have done different? <laughs> read more Jennings publicly. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's hard not to just read his commentary as you prepare a sermon just to go. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read this whole chapter. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And no doubt all three of us, because I think Jennings is a genius this way, all three of us will find ourselves at some point in the commentary going, oh, Oh, now I've found the point I disagree with, <laughs> and I'm not. No, and, and everyone will be able to tell it because there'll be one sermon where he just disappears from the quotes. <laughs> um, but no, I, I thought that idea um, was one that I, I think. I, I mean, honestly, still just challenges me tons. I, you know, I said in the sermon uh, yesterday that I, I, I've always been an idealist on these things that I, I, I think it's important to, to allow acts, the, the idealism of acts to speak through, right? And, and a few people in the questions and answers even led into that. They're like, like Acts 2.42, it sounds amazing, right? They've got everything in common. They're sharing everything they have. They're selling possessions to help the needy. It's like they have everybody's favor, right? Like, like it seems right. like this idyllic moment of, you know, of, wow, this early church is going well. People are joining the church daily. But if you've read Acts before, you know that in a couple of chapters, time, well, actually, in one chapter, they're getting beat up for it. In a (laughs) few chapters, they're getting killed for it. And then a chapter after that, they're being scattered across the Roman world for it. So there is an idealism here, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's tricky and you know, David, you and I were talking afterwards about this idea of the difference between 
does it work and are we called to it? Um, mm. And there's people want to make everything so practical that until I can prove that this works the way that I want it to work um, and that there are no challenges <laughs> or that the challenges are at least minimal, um, mm. you know, what do, like, what do I do with that? I had the same conversation recently with some friends in the U S regarding, uh, you know, gun control and, and violence mm. and, and the call to nonviolence. And it, and it was amazing because it was like this, all the questions came back to like, yeah, that's nice. But what about this scenario? <laughs> yeah, that's mm. nice mm. that Jesus <laughs> said that. What about that scenario? And it's like, Right, but this that's not, you know, it's what I'm not saying is that nothing matters in our actual life. But on the other hand, I think we're called to something that is better and more daunting uh, for which we actually need God <laughs> mm. than the practical questions of does it work? Um, and that's where, that's what I think that, you know, faith is about. And you talked yesterday about mm -hmm. the, you know, the acts of the Holy spirit, like mm -hmm. the spirit is doing something. I, I'm, I'm talking too much. I'll say this though. I, I think the challenge of Pentecostalism, um, is that the spirit does something in our midst and almost immediately, uh, we, we first say, this is amazing. And then almost immediately we try to figure out how to undo it. Um, <laughs> this is true in, you know, um, at, at, at the beginning of the 20th century in Los Angeles, um, mm -hmm. the spirit comes and as Bartleman famously said, the color line was washed away, but, uh, Estrella Alexander says, you know, it didn't take us long to find it again. And so I think that this is part of the challenge for us as we read and talk about acts is this. The spirit does something and it doesn't take us long to, at first there's a sense of wonder and awe, but it doesn't take us long to get to like, oh my goodness, what's ha what's actually happening here? Now it feels scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and I think, you know, talking about, are we called to it and does it work? I think the interesting piece in that too is defining what does it mean for something to work in that sense? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, sometimes we think it works because it keeps us all in comfortable space and it keeps us all together and it keeps us all right. Like, and that, and that's even in what you're talking about, Phil, right? It's easy for us to, um, to kind of fall back into old habits just because we say well, it's working, it's working and we're all kept here together. But the stories, you know, uh, of acts, it says, well, yeah, they are scattered, but they're preaching the gospel everywhere that they go. So the gospel is, you know, from them it's, and it comes back to Andrew root stuff again, no surprise that we find ourselves um, mentioning his name in our conversations, but of the church and crisis and how we navigate a bunch of these, you know, these spaces together. And I've always mm -hmm. been reminded of, um, of a, of a quote that says, you know, Christians are kind of like manure. Um, you keep them all together and they stink but you spread them out and everything starts to grow. Um, and you know, as you, as you, as the kind of the scattering piece of, I think there almost is a sense of, well, it appears to us maybe like it doesn't work the way that we would want it to work, which allows us to stay within comfortable walls and comfortable groups of people. Even as mm -hmm. you look at the apostles and the people they find themselves with, but does that mean it's right? Is that the way it was supposed to work? I think is an even, you know, another question on top of that when we start to wrestle through that. Mm. Yeah, I, I think um, I, <laughs> I'm laughing at, I'm laughing at our, our similarities just at the moment uh, of, of how, of how we all, of how we all do things. Um, you know, Phil's got that same habit that, that, that I have where I'm like, I'm talking about something that has some controversy for it. How do we all live in common? So in order to explain this controversial thing, I'm going to use an example of another controversial thing, which is gun control. <laughs> and I'll use this controversial thing to explain the other controversial thing. And then mm -hmm. Tyson tops that off by insulting us all by going like, we're like manure. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's like, exactly. Uh, I love the fact that all three of us have the sort of same didactic method <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I think that 
like I'm reminded of, of Stanley Hauerwas uh, when he talks about nonviolence uh, and he says the constant question that he gets when he talks about this is people saying, oh, I don't think this works. I don't think you can do this. And Hauerwas' kind of question is, or, or response is, you might be right. It is actually, he says, I'm not sure that nonviolence does work in our world, but but we are, as the church, not called to offer something that works. We're called to witness to another kingdom, <laughs> and, yes. um, and 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 mm, we're yeah. called to 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 show a, a different way of of, of being. And, and so, I, I wonder. You know, my thought was that that kind of links to what both of you are are, are saying. That there's when we when we gather together to use your manure example, Tyson. When we gather together and try and build our own empire, <laughs> it becomes really ugly and, and, and horrible. But also when we when we discredit any model that the church, and I'm cautious of using the church models because it always sounds like, you know, pastors trying to church turn biblical ideas into book sales. But, you know, <laughs> but when we, you know, when we see what's going on in Acts, this is this, and, you know, use this word idealism again. This is a, a an image of a witness, and I can't help but have Acts 1-8 in my mind. You will be my witnesses. Right? That's, that's the kind of, baseline of what this church is called to do isn't it is to witness mm. uh, and so i wonder if we can be brave enough sometimes to say uh you know hey listen here we're trying to figure out a way to live with everything in common uh and people say well i'm not sure that works <laughs> if our response might be oh no we're not sure it works either right but we're also not sure we're also convinced that what we're trying to do elsewhere isn't working and yeah. this is our witness to something else i mean does that I mean, does that track with you or resonate with you? Absolutely. I, you know, one of the things that was said um, by one of the congregants after the service was, what if the thing that's most in common here is Jesus himself? And that can mm. sound at first like an over-spiritualized answer. And yet mm. there's a real depth to that because... Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that often happens with this text is people say like, well, what's the difference here between communism in which everybody in common or, or what have you, you know, mm -hmm. um, and what we're seeing in acts two and the, the answer, I mean, I, you could say two things, of course, um, one being that, well, God himself, um, they are centered around Jesus. This is not an imposed thing. This is something that the spirit is doing in them in which mm -hmm. they say, we're going to live our lives centered around Jesus. So how, um, how does mm -hmm. that, it witnesses to something else, mm -hmm. something that even the world can try, but doesn't work either in that sense, but not only doesn't work, but is harmful. But is there a sense that here it's like, no, we're living something of God's future in the present moment with Jesus at the center. And mm -hmm. no matter how messy it gets, whether it, you know, uh, to Tyson's point works according to our view, at least, right. Or doesn't, and all of these kinds mm -hmm. of things, um, what is it that we're witnessing to? And so I found that I found that that comment at the end of the sermon was actually quite beautiful. It's like what well, the commonality here is Jesus. And so there is this idea of a witness to Jesus, um, even in the messiness of it, of we're trying to live something of that future in the present moment. So, yeah, I mean, I, re I resonate with that a lot. The, the comment, um, you know, yeah, because it, it, I love the multi layers of dialogue that you have that where we where we, we teach people, you know, and, and you listen to a teaching. Now we've created space in the services for for public dialogue. But then there's also there's the there's in this dialogue after the sermon, yes. which is what I mean, yes. I, it's, in one sense, I, I often think that can be the best dialogue is, mm -hmm. is, hey, here's some thoughts that I've not quite processed enough that I want to say out loud. But now that I'm saying it more privately, I can think this through. I, I, I mean, just in, you know, kind of resonating with what you're saying, Phil, I, I've often wondered about the exploitation and the commodification of, uh, of kind of economic models. So, 
you know, as Westerners, we're, we're kind of taught from a very early age to fear communism and all things, right? Um, and, and the moment you start to talk about commonality, as we, as we see, um, I think at one point in uh, one of the texts I was reading this week, they, they talked about communalism. And, and I decided there's no way I'm brave <laughs> enough to attempt to say <laughs> communalism <laughs> in a oh, sermon. Man. And, uh, but, you know, the having of everything in common, it, does, it triggers a lot of us in the West to, to do exactly what you've said. Oh, that sounds like communism. Yeah. I think that, you know, just to, to wade into this, I think that both communism and capitalism are, are broken systems. I yes. think, you know, again, I'm going to sound like a really, like a classic pastor comment here. But, you know, I think the brokenness is both are absent Jesus. Right? And, um, but, but actually, that's an easy way to say that there's a problem. But one of the things I see in both of them, as no expert on this by any stretch, is both of them commodify people in different ways. Right? You know, so, so communism commodifies you as in your job is to work for everybody else and you work for the, for the whole and that's what that's what works for us. Capitalism says, no, you are the product to whom we will sell things. And yes. as long as you keep buying, we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you get to acts, and you look about this. This they had everything in common. They were together. There was no one who had need, and they had the favor of all the people. Like this is, people are not commodities in this system. That's being this kingdom vision, and, yes. and so I, I feel like it is common for us as Christians to worry. I think as Western Christian, particularly. Oh, this sounds a little communistic, but actually, I think that classically for the Gospels. What we're seeing in Acts 2.42 is a critique of all systems that don't put Jesus and therefore humans as a, as a protected category within them. I mean, yes. that, that's, maybe that's a bad way to explain what's going on in my mind at the moment. But, um, yeah, let me see what you two want to respond to that. <laughs> no, I, 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 it, it resonates with me as well because I do think – and I think we – here's my – I think we're so hesitant again to say, oh, I don't want to over-spiritualize and here's a pastor mm. answer of, you know, they're absent from Jesus. I actually think we just need to probably get to spaces of, you know, to be courageous enough to say, no, this is what we see and we don't think it's an over-spiritualization. It's actually just mm -hmm. how we see scripture mm. unpacking this and talking about it and, and, and how we're called to live in it. And so I would, I would agree with you com completely. And I think our common a common mistake that we sometimes w will make is we assume that we have to work within the structures of the world that are around us. And then we try yeah. to jam Jesus somehow into them instead of being, um, you know, brave enough to say, actually, we think there's a third option. There's another way outside of what we're currently seeing that we believe that we're called to live within and, um, and, you know, to use the language of acts that you guys have both used to witness to in that sense and to, to participate mm -hmm. in. And so, um, yeah, so it resonates with me and I would, I would agree with what you're saying there. Yeah. And, and I also think the, we're meant to bump up against this. Like if it's just meant to make us uncomfortable. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, and, and this is what the kingdom does. It's, confronts all of our systems. You know, I, I remember years ago, David, I was in, um, in Thailand with a group of missionaries from there and somebody, I, I can't remember what country they were from, but they talked about this lady who got off the plane and she said, you know, Oh man, it feels so dark here. You can feel the oppressiveness. And he said, of course, you know, a lot of us hear this all the time. Uh, this person coming from America and they all kind of nodded. And he said, what was, uh, he said, nothing unusual about hearing that. What was unusual is that she went back home and she had this realization of, you know, to, to use a real uh, Pentecostal term here. <laughs> um, she said she realized that she, the reason she felt it there and not back where she lived is because it was a familiar spirit, right? Like we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hear this in these, in these sometimes strange contexts, but um, for us, we become familiar, so familiar with our systems, um, mm. with our investment into them, that mm. they seem natural and they mm -hmm. seem um, 
well, that, that's just the way things are, you know, Rodney Clapp in his, in his most recent book, um, uh, about capitalism, he says, this is exactly the notion that we have to challenge if, if it's ever going to change. He said, everybody thinks this thing just naturally came into being. <laughs> he said, that's simply <laughs> not the case. <laughs> and, um, so I think what gets confronted in us when we read these stories is the systems of which we are so used to, I am totally with you, Tyson. We're so used to them that, um, suddenly we read something that bumps up against us and which is exactly why we say, well, how could that work? Totally. Because we've assumed the systems within which we live are reality are the ways on which, in which we are to get on in the world. And, um, this is again, the disruptive move of the spirit, which says, the things that you've taken for granted as the ground of being, uh, how to get on in the world. Um, I'm going to show you something else. The spirit's going to do something and it's going to really mess us up with that. And so I think, yeah, the thing that gets messed up there, the communism piece is almost an easy step to, because we're, we're removed, we're, we're removed enough from that, that we mm -hmm. can say, Oh, it's kind of like that instead of allowing the spirit to disrupt the unseen dis, uh, dysfunctional things within which we live in the current moment. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 that's a fantastic, um, I think that's a fantastic point, David. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement, Tyson, with where you, where you took that. I'm thinking about the line that, um, George Snyman uh, is one of our partners at Westside. He uh, he sort of founded Hands at Work, which are a long-term missional partner and justice partner at Westside. And uh, I wasn't present for this conversation, but I've had it reiterated to me that George was uh, was talking with some people from Westside once, and they somebody asked him like, like like is it not terrifying, you know, raising your kids in some of the parts of Africa that that you go to? <laughs> and and and, and Snyman said, the place that terrifies me most is taking kids to the mall, <laughs> mm. and uh, yes. and which which I think is a sort of what you were saying as well. Actually, we just become familiar with the mall, and then I'm thinking about James Smith's exegesis yep. of the mall. That the, the yes. mall directly speaks against what we're seeing in Acts. The mall yep. says, you know, it speaks to your ego, that egocentricity. Yeah. I, I, you know, Christos Yanaris' uh, quote that I talked about yesterday um, in, you know, or, or on Sunday, rather, you might not be listening to this today. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christos Yanaris' quote about how the, the religious person is so often supported by their own egocentricity. And, and, and you go to the mall, it feeds that. Look at what you could be. Look what you could be about. You don't, the, the mall doesn't encourage you to have everything in common with everybody else. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't encourage you to share your possessions. You, know, you don't walk down the mall and say, look at that jacket. That would be great for Tyson. <laughs> you know, like the mall is, is fundamentally forcing you to not think like that. And yeah. uh, and so, but but we uh, we have become dulled to the 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 dangers perhaps of our own system. So I, I love that perspective uh, that you brought. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. even the critique of you know some of what you had mentioned too yesterday, David, around even where prosperity gospel and some of these other things mm -hmm. have started to then take cues from culture, in that mm -hmm. sense to say, um, especially in you know in the Western context to say actually this is what we see this is what it's about and and then faith mm -hmm. becomes incredibly individualistic in how we talk about it and how we approach it and how mm -hmm. we think about it um which then then you know bleeds into how we teach and what we call people to and you know the the promises that sometimes get made to people from a platform about what god wants mm -hmm. to do for you specifically um and it and it, so it's a it's an interesting space I think even for the church in the West to find itself in is again we assume that we have to function um, within the contexts that are around us instead of mm. you know an openness to the yeah. creativeness I think of the spirit in that mm. sense that's not something I think we always discuss but mm. you know the the creativeness of God and the creativeness of the mm. spirit that wants to move in us and shape us as a community that is going to look very different. And it's why our natural instincts going to be, well, maybe that doesn't work um, because it's outside of mm -hmm. what we think might be a reality.
Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> that, I mean, it was interesting to me that the question about prosperity kind of was raised in the in the dialogue in in, in both congregations. Yes, uh, you know, on on Sunday, and and I, I think, I can't help but think of of Tom Wright's brilliant little quote that he, he talks about how when we talk about following Jesus in the West, he said, we like to say, oh, I'm following Jesus because I know it has a plan for my life, a plan to, to prosper me. And, and, you know, he said, and then when we actually listen to what Jesus says, he says stuff like, take up your cross and follow me to suffering. Right? Yeah, totally. and, 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 and your act story here that we're looking here has immense sacrifice involved in it. And it doesn't look like a particularly effective route to prosperity. Um, I, 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 I mean, we said this, we were joking about this, about how one of the challenges within the dialogue is it's invariably on the way home that you think of a better way to respond <laughs> to the totally but you know here's here's my take on on, on prosperity gospel the, the reason prosperity gospel is anti-christian um, is that it it takes as a starting point an assumption which is opposed to the gospel right? and so the assumption of the prosperity gospel is that financial wealth in this life is the thing that we are pursuing and it therefore then spiritualizes that right and spiritualizes that 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 is that and this is how god's going to help you get that and i what i often think is it fails in our critiques of prosperity is that is not is that we actually almost take the assumption and argue from that assumption but i would i would push and i'm curious both your, your responses to this i would push to say that it's basic assumption that having you know, health and wealth is what you need to have a good life. That isn't a biblical assumption. Uh, and, and therefore, if you start from a premise that isn't reflected, you know, in, in Christianity, in the way of Jesus, no matter how you spiritualize it, you're never going to end up with, uh, you know, I think, you know, the old adage that, you know, uh, you can't give a good answer to a bad question. Likewise, you can't get a good result from a bad st- assumption i mean does that i mean do you resonate with that so i keep throwing you in just throwing you both on the spot of going, hey what do you think of my harebrained idea but, but but that's kind of what i struggle with when i hear the arguments around prosperity that I, I i often think we don't often enough just allow ourselves to be cognizant that this basic premise isn't something we hear jesus talking about yeah I mean, so I'll I'll give two, the two sides of my thought here. So the first Mm. is, is, um, yes, absolutely. Like it is a, it is again, bumping up against the same thing that we're talking about with, I mean, in a lot of ways, the same thing we're talking about with capitalism, right? This is a way Mm. of life. Um, Mm. we're going to prolong our health as long as we can be in the best health, Mm. um, you know, acquire as much as we can. Jesus has a lot to say about that. Um, (laughs) The the other side of it is that, you know, in saying that, and I think this is why there's a, a a trick to talking about the, you know, prosperity Mm -hmm. um, is that neither does Jesus want our neighbors to be, to live in poverty and Mm. sickness um, mm. so this is actually the, 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 the other side of the same coin, right? So this is not mm. the disagreement. This is the, um, that also is the system of capitalism of mm. the way that our financial systems work is prosperity means these people prosper health means mm. these people have health. And, um, what I find fascinating, and I won't go too far here because this is going to be Tyson's, you know, text, I think, but, <laughs> um, one of the next things you see is suddenly there's a person who's begging by the temple gates mm. and, um, and becomes healed. Right. So, um, we see that, but the implication of this text also means that this person who was begging is not simply now healed, but is brought into the community where everybody has everything in common. Mm. Um, And so that too is a disruption of 
of, I think, our assumptions regarding the health wealth is because when we talk health wealth, it's health and wealth for me. Yes. Um, and where the spirit, the spirit comes and disrupts that and says, what about that guy that you've walked past a million times, um, you know, at the gate, does he get to be brought in to this community that shares everything in common? And that it just, again, you know, this is where Acts speaks of revolution. <laughs> we are disrupted again and again and again by the, by the spirit. So I think those mm. are kind of the two sides of, of my thoughts on that, which mm. I, I think are both saying kind of the same thing. They're both are a yes. disruption of, of our economic systems, systems of health as well. Yeah. And yes. let, let me, I guess, give you a little, a little a teaser into at least some of the thoughts that I'm starting to think through as I prep oh, for yeah. this, this, this coming Sunday in light of that comment there as well, David, because I do think it, 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 it fits in that. I think you're, I would agree with you on the foundational piece. And it's because of, again, not to feel like I'm circling the wagons a bunch, but it's what we're, it's what we're focusing on. Um, hmm. Willie Jennings in his commentary that I have read is going to talk about our eyes what we look at, how we, how we think about those things and what we see and, and then how that shapes our life, um, in, mm -hmm. in light of how we look at things and look at people and look at the world around us. Like our eyes are an incredible, um, part of who we are as humans and they will tell us a lot. Um, cause I even think about, you know, even how we care for people to go, you know, to, a, a the, the beggar in the temple, but even in our own context, there's people within all of our cities that are homeless and you, you know, you walk to a sporting event and there's people that are always there with signs and how many people refuse to even look at the person. There's something mm. that wants us to turn a blind eye to certain aspects yep. because then it mm. doesn't act. We don't have to acknowledge it and we don't have to, um, consider its impact in our own life if we don't mm. see it or we tell ourselves we didn't see it. Um, mm. and, and so I think some of that, yeah, as I think through even some of that prosperity stuff, the, the foundational piece is to look at wealth. I want to look at mm. success. Mm. I want to look at, um, my pursuit of that instead of actually looking at Jesus who looks at the marginalized, um, mm. and who looks at, you know, the entire city of Jerusalem and weeps over it, right? Like all of these, the, there's, there's, there's incredible language within scripture of, you know, mm -hmm. people being seen in that mm -hmm. sense. And when we only see wealth, we only see the pursuit of ourselves. We only see some of those things. We miss seeing a bunch of other stuff that I think God wants to do in us and yeah. through us. And that's the commonality piece that you start to see within you know, the beginning of Acts and all kind of through as they're finding people, they're seeing mm. people very different than them, but they're finding this commonality, which again is, is in Christ. Yeah. And, and I think that's a learned process as well, that, that we, that we learn to see, you know, yes. <laughs> uh, now, uh, you know, and I'm, I, you might, my brain's overloading with, with thoughts about how often you see, like I was thinking about the guy that Jesus meets that is blind and, and he first sees unclearly and then he sees more clearly and and, and i want to say the holy spirit's involved in that process of learning to see but but even like let me keep it super anonymous because i actually don't know who this works but but my wife was in a situation just recently and she was talking to some very young children about about some stories of jesus and and jesus's relationship to poor people and this child who is barely school age <laughs> said well, the poor people should just work harder so that they are not poor anymore. <laughs> wow! <laughs> like, um, and like, and this is this this child is not in grade school age yet. Yeah. Right? Mm. And um, and and so somebody uh, has taught this child how to see, right? And uh, somebody has, you, you know what I mean? Like, maybe yeah. not intentionally, but, but somewhere this child has learned this is how you look at poor people. And, yeah. and so I think one of the things we're seeing then in Acts is the Holy Spirit is teaching the disciples how to see. Look at us. I don't want to steal your sermon, Simon, just Tyson. But, you know, look at look at us. And but we also need to look at you. And, and, and we've got to now decide how are we changed by looking at each other, haven't we? How are we how are we impacted? Like mm -hmm. but but it is but it is a learned process. You do not 
you didn't you were not born capitalist you were not born communist you you, you yeah. and, and likewise you were not born initially into the way of jesus these are these are competing systems that you have learned and now must choose to allow the holy spirit to help you unlearn i think would be a way of phrasing that yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely I, I always say that um that that is the first miracle in the book of acts is mm. the healing of the disciples eyes um mm. I love that. Be, you know, because what it's consistent with the ministry of Jesus, who over and over again in the Gospels, we read that um, Jesus says, you have eyes, but you don't see ears, but you don't hear. Mm -hmm. um, and then has, you know, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm stealing here from uh, Rick Watts, but who, who talks about, you know, Jesus actually has a pattern to his miracles. He doesn't. This is what's so interesting with the uh, with with the apocryphal writings, right? It's like yeah. Jesus is turning like stones into birds and stuff, and you run away. <laughs> that's that's weird, um, because Jesus over and over is healing blind eyes, unstopping deaf ears, mm -hmm. raising the dead, casting out demons. So you have to look and say, okay, is there a pattern to what mm -hmm. what Jesus teaches and what he does is one and the same? And mm -hmm. I think that here. Uh, it's, I think it's nothing less than a miracle of, of healing a blind eye once again. So anyway, you know, now we're, now we're in like, <laughs> so true though, Phil, like the, the, we're getting too preachy on Tyson's text, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. Tyson's now I've got to change my entire sermon. <laughs> but, but think about, right. So, you know, think about Jesus in Luke four, right. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I want to actually point something out in just a few moments about, but, but think about Acts and Luke as you know we can overplay this but they are they are prequel and sequel right? the, the, you know these yeah. are these are two books which are designed to go together and if you were willing to take the time not a lot of time even and read them side by side not sequentially but side by side mm -hmm. the overlap between them is quite phenomenal but let me jump into that in just a second but Luke 4 Jesus announces from Isaiah this is what the Messiah is here to do. And, and so, so the little things, the Messiah will, will heal blind eyes, will you know, help the deaf speak, will, will help the, the, those who cannot walk. Sorry, no, will help the deaf to hear, and, and those who cannot walk be able to walk. Now, <laughs> at the risk of sounding a little rabbinic for a second, search the scriptures and you will find <laughs> that, right? that those three things never happen in the Old Testament. Right. So at no point in the Old Testament is a blind eye healed. Right? Mm. At no point in the Old Testament does somebody who is, who is unable to hear and speak, speak and a lame, uh, you know, sorry, that's the old King James language, but a person who cannot walk uh, doesn't walk. The, the, the dead are raised in the Old Testament. The, the lepers are healed. But those three things and what happens in the intertestamental period is the observation that Isaiah says when the Messiah comes, these things you will see. And the fact mm. that we have never seen these things happen, the, 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 the implication is when we see those things, then the Messiah must be here. But of course, the second half of the Isaiahic quotation is also about prisoners set free, the poor, you know, the, the raising of valleys, the lowering of mountains. So mm. there is, I think, in the mind of Jesus, a scriptural basis for the healing of blind eyes and the eradication of the poor as, as you know, as a social class, you know, the, the, the raising up of people out, out of poverty. Um, yes. And just as a little side note, just because just I always think it's helpful to know, when Lazarus dies and, and, and some of the religious leaders are around, they ask a question that only makes sense to us if we follow that messianic logic. They hmm. say, isn't it strange that this man who could heal the blind can't raise the dead or they say forgive me i don't have the text right in front of me but there's an implication that it's strange that jesus can't do anything about lazarus can he can heal the blind and we mm. as moderners would seem seem to think healing the blind is easier to do than raising <laughs> the dead but but in an old testament rabbinic logic raising the dead is something any prophet can do <laughs> so mm. so actually mm. healing the blind requires a higher wow. level of, sort of spirituality to it uh, because that you must be you, you at least pertain to be messianic. But mm. anyway, to the more important point that in response to, to what you're saying there, Phil, is that there is, even in the messianic expectation, a connection between these particular types of healings yes. and 
and poverty and prisoners. You know, don't forget John the Baptist's question to Jesus. You're healing the blind and you're helping the poor, but I'm in prison. <laughs> so, mm. like, what are you going to do about that? Yeah. I love the way it all kind of intersects and connects yeah. together. Yes, yeah. Speaking of which, can I show you something really cool? <laughs> Do it, of, of course. <laughs> so this is this this is another something that I really wanted to fit into the sermon, but couldn't figure a way to do it because <laughs> there wasn't enough time to just go. Hey, can I show you something really cool? <laughs> 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 so um, bear, bear in mind what I just said about Luke and Acts. There's there's prequels and sequels, but there's almost a level that they're following the same plot line, right? That you know, there's like, how does it begin? Yeah. Where's the Holy Spirit come in? But Beginning of Luke's gospel, we meet this character called John the Baptist, right? So hold that in mind. Remember what we talk, what I talked about yeah, yeah, on Sunday, sorry, not yesterday, because you may not be listening now. So, so Holy Spirit comes, right? Um, Peter preaches his sermon. The congregation gathered say, oh, my goodness, then what should we do? Remember that question, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, Right? Mm. And the next que- the next thing that we then see, uh, and I didn't get into this, repent, be baptized, and save yourself from this corrupt generation. There's a little bit of social critique from, from Peter for us. Right? Mm. And then the next thing we see is they were devoted to each other. They had everything in common. They shared their possessions. Right. So hold that in mind. What should we do? Repent and be baptized. And also now we have everything in common. Flip back to Luke's gospel. We meet John the Baptist. John the Baptist appears with his a brilliant preaching methodology, you brood of vipers. <laughs> but then he says this to the people, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Mm, okay, so mm. there's an interesting little comment. So, so he, and he tells them, he says, listen, you know, this, this, something's happening. God is bringing some purification along here, and we need to produce fruit that lines up with what God is doing. And then Luke 3, verse 10, look at what the people say. What shall we do? Mm. <laughs> it's the same question, right? Yep, Early yep. part of that. But notice what Luke replies, right? Even tax collectors came and said, what should we do? And they came to be baptized. So we have repentance language, baptism language, and the people say, what should we do? Even some soldiers come, verse 14, <laughs> what should we do? And now what's amazing is, is what John tells them to do, right? Um, and he says to them, if you have two shirts, you should share it with someone who has none and mm. anyone has food should do the same. <laughs> wow. Wow. So Not amazing. it's exactly the same thing that we yes. see happen in acts. John's painting yep. the picture. You have to repent. You have to change the way that you're living. You have to, we have to do something. Well, what is it that we should do? And, mm. and John, and we don't often hear of John the Baptist as the great social equalizer. We don't think about John the Baptist as someone who proclaimed a message of commonality, but right. actually there's Luke, John and Luke, and then the church in Acts do a consistent message from Amazing. before and after the message of Jesus, yeah. which I think is pretty cool. And this is why we ask the question, what didn't you fit in your sermon on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Man. Beautiful. Yeah, That's great. Um, and, and, then, and then listen, as we're, as we're kind of running out of time, I want to ask both of you this, because we ran out of time in the second service. But um, I, I wanted to talk uh, when we, so people that made it to, to 9 a.m. heard this part of the conversation, and then uh, we, had, we had a different dialogue uh, in, 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 this, in the 11 a.m. service. But I, I shared in, in 9 a.m. this quote from the Stegeman brothers on, on, on what meals do and how food works as a bit of a code, right? Um, so let me, let me read a couple of moments of it, because bear in mind, we're looking at Acts, and they're gathered together, you know, as, um, and they're eating together all the time. And the Stegemans point out, they say that um, table fellowship is one of the most effective possibilities for defining and differentiating oneself through social groups. Uh, and then they go on to say that food, therefore, can be understood as a code that makes it possible to decipher the social structures expressed in it. The message contained in the food code reveals something about the levels of social hierarchy, about inclusion in or exclusion from groups, about social boundaries, and about transactions across these social boundaries. 
And I found that quote really fascinating, thinking about this early group of, of eclectic people meeting together and, and us not rushing past. And I love that somebody picked up on it in one of the dialogue points. There are several points it talks about eating in this short passage, breaking mm-hmm. bread twice, you know, uh, and eating together. Uh, and, and I love this idea that one of the ways – you know, the question, how do we have things in common? How do we find that question got put to me a few times over our barbecue yesterday afternoon, right? Mm. Like, how do we get to having things in common? And I found myself reflecting on the Stegeman's comment and Acts 2, 42 to 47. And the answer sounds maybe too simplistic, but I wonder, the answer, is the answer eating together? Because when we share a meal, it levels us all off into the same space. And maybe the genius of Jesus is present in the text itself, mm. that you, you're not going to fall accidentally into common with each other. But if you're willing to sit at the table and eat the same food, yeah. uh, you know, so maybe again, Eucharist has something to teach us. Uh, <laughs> but I, didn't, I don't want us to sort of stop recording this morning without just a little reflection on what I felt at the very least was a really significant quote that helped us unpack a little bit of what's going on in this passage of Acts 2. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I love the quote and I, and I think even, you know, culturally when you think about the significance of eating in Jesus's time and even what that represented, mm-hmm. I think there's something mm-hmm. for us to learn in that, that there's this sense of acceptance that happens around the table and around food, mm-hmm. um, which is why, you know, Pharisees were so upset with Jesus going, why are you eating with sinners and tax collectors and all of these, <laughs> you know, different characters, because it's saying something about mm-hmm. who you are and the types of people that you're willing to, you know, spend time with. And I think about, um, even in my own life, right? The people that I find myself around a table with, there Mm -hmm. is something significant in that. There's a depth to relationship that happens in that. It's Mm -hmm. almost a slowing down of, for us and in the West, I think of a, of a crazy fast food world that wants to, you know, move from one thing to the next, that to have other people around a Mm -hmm. table to eat demands, that we slow things down, that we become present to a moment and people around a table with us. And, and, and mm-hmm. so I would agree completely that I, I, I think it, it's intentional work um, mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. to have things in common. We know that there's something central as we've already talked about in Jesus that brings us together, but then there's a depth to understanding, you know, who we are as God's creation, his image bearers, mm-hmm. all, all of us bearing his image. And, and people to be explored and, and, and loved and cared for and, you know, mm-hmm. to, to, to discover different personalities and wirings and ways of, you know, viewing that happens yeah. Yeah. not in passing by and saying, hi, nice to see you. I know we all attend, you know, this church community <laughs> together, but in actually mm-hmm. slowing down to say, who are you? Um, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and what do you think about these things or who just what do you enjoy? What do you see? Right? Like what, what makes yeah. you tick? I, I, I think there's something deeply significant. I know communion is a part of that as well. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. A flattening of that. But I think even just general meals, um, mm-hmm. uh, are massively impactful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to Luke, um, Julie Candless says there's not a single chapter in Luke that doesn't mention a meal or feeding, <laughs> which is incredible, really, yeah. when you think of it. And um, mm. so I work in, as most most people who listen would probably know, I work in a multi-faith context. Um, so in that means that every time we eat together, it is a... Uh, it's a very complicated yet beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Um, It's complicated because you have a just normal dietary restrictions that people have, but then you have Mm -hmm. religious dietary restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. You have people who eat kosher, people who eat halal. And so when we gather together for a common meal, it, it is, necessarily we're just like okay we're we're eating vegan um mm. <laughs> you know um but but falafel so, for the win <laughs> what's that falafel for the win <laughs> exactly exactly um 
but the, you know, there's a, a, a way of coming it, it mm-hmm. that table says something to us mm-hmm. that, um, totally. you know, as opposed to the, sometimes I hear Christians say, Oh, I could never, you know, be this or that because I, you know, I love bacon too much. Well, I eat bacon. I love bacon, but at the same time, it's, there is when you actually begin to eat with other people, um, who are different from you and share a common meal, um, you will necessarily have to give things up. Mm. And I think it is the table of the Lord, which teaches us how mm. to be a common people and how to yeah. um, do this. And so it actually is, mm. I think, quite a radical act and one in which um, we're challenged, you know, the University of mm. Calgary. Uh, let me just throw them under the bus for a minute. Um, they have very, very few spaces to eat halal food. And yet, um, mm. you know, a very large Muslim student population. Mm. Um so this is this is problematic so what does the church how does the table of the lord uh and our commonality around jesus inform our own tables i think is is one of the ways that i walk away from that because it really does level hierarchies it speaks to injustices um all of these kinds of things food food and david you and i did a thing uh several years back at the lent retreat Mm, yeah but i you know i talk I talk about this uh, with with people frequently, like pay attention to food in the Bible uh, as a (laughs) theological category. And people, what do you mean? (laughs) But what does it mean that Luke uses a meal or feeding in every single chapter? Um, Mm. Food is everywhere. And so, yeah, I loved, I loved that quote so much. Mm. Mm. I love, I, yeah, I I remember that Lent retreat and the whole subject was food and everybody said at the end, like, um, we didn't know how you were going to fill a whole weekend of seminars on food, but, you know, and this is not to, not to embarrass anyone, but one of the things we did at the Lent retreat was we, we set people a task for the weekend. And the task was on the final session. Uh, so we arrive Friday night, we leave Sunday afternoon. Do you remember this, Phil? The oh, final yeah. session, the final session, you need to just talk about a meal in your life that was significant to you. Right? It was unbelievable. Now think about that as a headline. Think about that as a headline, right? Talk about a meal that was significant to you. People were broken. <laughs> People were oh sharing goodness. beautiful stories. Everybody was was tearful Weeping. as they heard people. <laughs> like, oh my yeah. goodness, it was. And and in the, and in the sense of how people realizing how significant meals are to us. Um, I, you know, uh, just to <laughs> not not shameless self promotion, but in the other podcast that I'm part of, in two texts with John Andrews, John has this phrase. Where about Luke's gospel, where he just says, in Luke, Jesus gets himself killed because of how he eats. <laughs> and, um, totally. And, and actually, you know, that, and it's because he, he speaks to your point, Phil, that Jesus is eating all the time in Luke's gospel. The problem is he's always eating with the quote unquote wrong people. <laughs> and, um, and, and then, but, you know, even just to add to your thoughts there, the both of you, like, are we being, you know, there's a part, I could imagine somebody listening going, this is ridiculous. You genuinely think that the way of, the way of solving the world's problems and bringing in the kingdom of Jesus is food. <laughs> mm. But think about what is going on in Acts. By the time it's 15, they've got full church councils going on about how we're going to eat together, right? Yeah. Galatians is an entire text of the Bible that is about eating together, actually. If you go and read it, it all, it all hinges on, like, how do we do this food together? Paul in Corinthians is saying, listen, if you love Jesus, you might have to be a vegetarian <laughs> because, mm. because if you're hanging out with people that don't eat the meat that you're eating, then, then I'm like the, the classic thing is you said, Phil, and I, I know you, you, you're joking a little bit about the bacon thing because we need to keep <laughs> our Canadian cards, but, they have, you know, <laughs> but, but, but Paul is literally addressing that issue that a Christian does not have the right to say, I'm not willing to eat with you because I like bacon. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> like Paul's, Paul's literally like, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, I won't eat meat at all if it means we can eat together. Right. Um, and, and so like, think about the whole new Testament so often is focusing around the meal. Uh, and I just want to draw our attention to maybe what Acts is showing us is that it's because the meal has much more power 
than 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 we're willing to admit, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, maybe the fact that Jesus was uh, in a feeding trough at the beginning might be a, <laughs> a slight <laughs> clue to us of to the uh, the important nature of, of oh, these yeah. things. Let's do this then. Let's do this. Let's leave the Jesus in the feeding trough as our final thought. <laughs> and, and let's just like commit it. publicly. Let's just commit publicly that we need to teach a series on food soon. Yeah. <laughs> I yes. like it. 